Our study this morning, and by the way, this really is our final study in 1 Corinthians. We actually two more Sundays after this, uh, but that's just Paul sort of wrapping up some unfinished business. Uh, but the end of the teaching and the end of the doctrinal section, the end of the correction is today. Would you read along with me, beginning in verse 51? Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, please note the alls. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come, death has been swallowed up in victory, and where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. I like this one, but thanks be to God. And that's a thanks be to God that we're not under the law. Because all the law did was condemn us. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And please highlight that. Stand firm and let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Good morning, Father. As we come before you this morning with our Bibles open, Holy Spirit, open our hearts. Make us men and women committed to stand firm, to be immovable in this always changing, always moving world. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us here would love you more than ever before. And as we look forward to your coming for us, I pray, Lord, that we would be about your business until you do. Lord, I'm asking you to give spiritual gifts today, particularly one I'll talk about in a moment. But I pray, O oh God, that we would bring honor and glory to you by going out to the highways, the byways, wherever it is we are, that the gospel of grace, but thanks be to God for grace, this gospel of grace would always be on our lips. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here in this first service or anyone coming to the two services that follow, if they're not yet born again, if they're not yet yours, that this would be the day. Holy Spirit, knock and keep knocking. Jesus, stand before them and open your arms and bid them to come. Father God, it was you who loved the world so much that you gave your only Son, that whosoever believed would not perish but have everlasting life. May that begin in this place today for your glory. Amen. I've been praying a lot for this spiritual gift. Now, we've studied the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. We've been in this book now for a little bit more than a year. Uh, we've got, as I said a moment ago, two more studies after this one in it. Then we'll be going on to the Gospel of Mark, so you can read ahead. But a large part of this was talking about spiritual gifts, the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us, and we went exhaustively through a list of the gifts of the Spirit. But here's one that wasn't listed, and yet I believe it is a gift of the Holy Spirit as much and as certainly as any of the others, and it's the gift of stubbornness. <laughs> Anybody like me already professional at that? <laughs> Stubbornness. Now, it's a godly stubbornness. We don't want to be stubborn just for being stubborn. But a godly stubbornness that what we have, we're holding on to, and we will never let go. At the end of this 15 chapters of correction, of rebuke, of some important doctrines, discussions on the Spirit of God and His gifts and the love that must accompany those gifts, 
Paul closes this letter by saying, stand firm. If you've ever watched the Weather Channel in particular, when there's a hurricane going on, and they've got these reporters, they're crazy. I don't know how much they get paid, but it's not enough. But everybody is ordered off the streets and they're, and they're kind of like standing like this because the wind is blowing them. And sometimes they'll blow because the wind is that strong and they'll just sort of blow across the screen and you'll think, why are they doing that? But you see, we live in a world that right now is coming at us. Those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, it's coming at us at hurricane force. And we're being moved. The church of Jesus Christ is being moved. Now, don't worry. The gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. But we see these huge swings doctrinally. We see the world forcing the church and individual Christians into compromise all the time. God says, this is what marriage is. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You and I, we're not. The world isn't. And yet the church says, well, maybe we can revisit that and the world won't hate us so much. Many of you are being asked to move at your place of employment. Some of you are being asked to take sensitivity training. Some of you are being forced to change the way you speak to people and about people. Are we going to be moved? Are we going to stand steady and firm and immovable? Now, the reason I want all of you to receive this gift of godly stubbornness is because it's a gift that I've been given in layers. Once the word of God has revealed something to my heart, Nothing, no one can change my mind. And that's what I'm praying for us in these last days. As we look forward to our resurrection bodies, as we look forward to that moment when Jesus calls us out of this world, we need to stand firm, anchored in the truth of Jesus Christ. One final thought, and then we'll get into the verse-by-verse study. There is an amen or woman in this room, including me, who is going to be able to be stubborn enough to resist the pushing and the pulling this world has as its goal toward us, unless you are a man or woman stubbornly committed to the Word of God. If you pick up your Bibles once a week to bring them to church, you're not going to stand. The world is too strong, the, the persuasion too powerful. The temptation to compromise never, ever leaves us. And the only way, the only way you can do that is to be a man or woman of the word. Not occasionally, not casually, but because you know it's the only way that we can live, the only way we can thrive and be used by God. You must be committed to your word, and I'm praying that you will make a commitment to be stubborn about that very thing in our study this morning. Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, we spoke about the rapture last time. I'm going to cover some of that ground again, so this part of the study ought to go fairly quickly. It's important for us because there are people who say that the rapture of the church doesn't really matter, that in terms of importance, it's just not that big a deal. You know, you're pre-trib, they're post-trib, uh, somebody's mid-trib or pre-wrath. Well, what's the matter? I'm pan-trib. It's all going to pan out in the end. This is a critical doctrine of the church, and we'll see how critical it is to the Apostle Paul today. There are those who say that the rapture isn't even taught in the Bible. You can't find the word rapture, no matter how hard you find. But here it is. Any and every 
honest thinking person who reads these two verses, 51 and 52, can't miss the fact that there's going to be a rapture. It's not if there's a rapture, it's when the rapture occurs and there's honest but unnecessary disagreement about even that. Now, why is the timing of the rapture so important? I want to point out two things to you this morning. First, the timing of the rapture deals with the very character and nature of God. If you believe that the rapture is going to come after the Great Tribulation and Christians are are going to be in the Great Tribulation, God is going to pour out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world, He's going to leave us here, well, then you're messing around with the nature and the character of God. We're not appointed unto wrath. Paul writes that to the churches in Thessalonica. But unto salvation, uh, Abraham and Jesus negotiated over this very point. Will the righteous judge of all of the earth not do right and save any who are righteous? Along with the wicked. And Jesus agreed with him. So Jesus is going to pour out his wrath on this world. Justice is once again going to come into view in this world. However, he can't pour his wrath on you and me because God's wrath has already been poured out on our behalf and it was poured out, of course, on Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to point out here is that Jesus himself, speaking of the second coming in judgment. Now, this is not the rapture, but this is Jesus' second coming. Revelation chapter 19, but the principle works the same. Jesus said, suppose the the wicked servant says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of, of teeth. I, I don't want to be considered, nor do I want any of you to be considered a wicked, lazy servant. Oh, what's the difference if he comes in the rapture? Jesus' is coming is near. And when we're not looking for Jesus, and I mean literally looking for Jesus each and every day, then we are defined by Jesus' own words as those wicked and lazy servants. Timing matters. It matters a lot. And as you hear me say, almost weekly, he's coming soon. Guess what? He's coming very soon. So what is the rapture? It's not science fiction. I thought it was sort of twilight zoning when I first heard about it as a brand new Christian, I I didn't know what I was getting into. I went to breakfast with two men who were sort of mentoring me. And at breakfast, they thought that would be a great opportunity to, to tell me about the rapture. And all I wanted to do was leave. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. I I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about doctrine. And they started telling me about the rapture. Well, the rapture is not science fiction and it's not frightening, not at all. It's a time when Jesus calls us to be with him where he is. We've talked about John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3 a lot. That's when Jesus looked at his heartbroken disciples. They realized finally in this upper room discourse, they realized finally that that he's going to die. And Jesus looks at him and he says, don't be troubled. Anybody here think that worked? Don't be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me and my Father's house are many rooms and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me where I am. That's Jesus hinting at the rapture of the church. I had the kids at the academy one day a couple of years ago. I was answering some Bible questions for them in a class. And one of the kids raised his hand and said, Pastor Ron, is the rapture going to hurt? And I said, not at all. It's absolutely going to be wonderful. And uh, in mass, they were ready to go right then and right there. I want you to be ready to go. In this passage, Paul tells us five things about the rapture. Again, I'll get through these fairly quickly. The first thing that he says is that it's a mystery. It was waiting to be revealed at just the right time to just the right person. The Apostle Paul 
was that person. The Greek word is musterion, and it means simply something that's never yet been revealed fully. And we have no record of when that happened. All we have is the record that it happened to the Corinthians. He says, I tell you a mystery. And the Apostle Paul's joy was the fact that he was able to declare the mystery to the Corinthians. And basically he's saying, look, because of all of this, everything else that we've talked about in this difficult letter, understand that that moment is coming quickly. Be ready for it. Live our lives for him. The rapture is a mystery. People say, oh, you Christians, it's a fairly new teaching. It's not a new teaching. One thing I want you to note here in these opening verses is that the Apostle Paul himself believed that the rapture of the church would happen in his lifetime. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, that doesn't mean Paul was naming dates. It doesn't mean that he was a false prophet because he died and the rapture hadn't happened. He just understood that the rapture of the church was our blessed hope. He understood that the rapture of the church was a wonderful thing. Remember, he had been in heaven. He saw things, inexpressible things, things that man's not permitted to tell. In other words, he couldn't wait to come back and tell us. And Jesus looked at him and said, shh. Can you imagine how hard that secret would be to keep? But it's also why Paul could say, to die and be with Christ is better by far. He'd actually been there. And the rapture of the church is our blessed hope in a world that as of right now seems to have very little hope. That's the first thing. It's a mystery. The second thing the rapture means is that according to Paul, we will not all die. He says that when he says we will not all sleep. That's just a common euphemism of the day for death. There's some who try to distort those the, the use of the word sleep and say no no we're, we're not going to die we're just going to have a soul sleep and 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 that's not at all what's in view here we're not all going to die i've been around enough death as a pastor that i can't wait for that moment when death is completely defeated most of us, if not every one of us, have been touched by death. Our hearts have been broken. We grieve. We're Christians. We grieve. We don't grieve like people with no hope, but we grieve, and it's painful. But you see, we know we're going to see our loved ones again. If, in fact, they were born-again believers, if they weren't, well, if they had to say so, they'd come back and tell you, believe him. It's true. Give your heart to Jesus. This passage is important. We're not all going to die. The third thing about the rapture, Paul says, is that we're all going to be changed. That's why we need new bodies. I told you last week that these earthly bodies, we can't even go in an airplane without the airplane being pressurized above 10,000 feet. We certainly don't have bodies that are fit for heaven. And so the rapture is a promise that we will be changed. These worn out earthly bodies are going to be changed, traded in for a brand new model that will never again need to be improved. I told you repeatedly, this is my great hope. I want out of this body as quickly as I can. The fourth thing that Paul says about the rapture is it's going to happen fast. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, the truth is, we don't know how fast that is, but trust me, it's fast. And it's going to happen in an instance. There's not going to be any warning. We talk about Jesus is coming soon, and we start thinking in terms of days or weeks or months or years, and that's not the idea. It's the idea of suddenness unbelievable suddenness. We won't have time to think about it. We won't see bright lights and say, oh, I better give my life to Jesus right now. It's going to happen so fast that we have to be prepared before it happens. That means is the day is coming soon when God is going to be done, finished, completely tolerating sin. I often think in terms of a sort of a countdown clock. Ten to go, nine to go, eight to go, seven to go. Well, one day in heaven, there's going to be that countdown clock dealing with Gentile converts to Christianity. And we're going to go two, two one, and Jesus, it's going to happen. 
that suddenly. I long for that moment when God is done with sin. I long for the moment when we can watch a television commercial. Wait a minute, in heaven there won't be commercials. Isn't that better? But we can't do anything now without having sin crammed down our throats. Jesus, I promise you, is going to be done with sin. For all of us who have cried many tears, those tears are being stored up in a bottle in heaven. We're going to see the result of those tears when we get to be with Jesus. But for those of us who have cried and wondered, God, this isn't fair. God is going to be done with sin. And evil is going to be vanquished in that day, at least from my perspective, can't come quickly enough. Now, there are two phases of this physical resurrection. The first is those who are dead. They will be raised in an instant before those who are living or, and this is the idea that I think makes the most sense, it means that the people who die in Christ already there with him have preceded us. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 14 through 18, gives us the two aspects of the physical resurrection. The first, in first beginning in verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul writes, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep or died in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left till the coming of the Lord, again, there's another place where Paul says, I'm expecting to be one of those, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead will rise first. That's phase one. Phase two begins in verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I included verse 18 just because I like to encourage you. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, how encouraging would I be if I explained to you, Jesus is coming for us, can't wait to come to but before that, we're going to be in the worst tribulation in the history of the world, and you're just going to have to go through it. That wouldn't be encouraging. So the second phase of the resurrection, the physical resurrection, is the dead who are with him, we will be together with them, with him, in heaven forever and ever. A word here about the dead in Christ. If they're going to be raised physically first, the question was asked in Thessalonica, the question I'm sure has been asked in your mind and in your heart, where are the dead now? Paul makes it clear that all believers, the moment we leave these bodies, go into the presence of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we need to know that and understand it. You know, one of the really difficult things about watching people suffer and die, and by the way, use the word die. It glorifies what God has done for us. They've passed. We like that better because it's not so harsh. No, they died. The body died. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing because then we get these new physical resurrected bodies if they just passed or if they've gone to a better place. We're missing the opportunity that God will use to create if we let just be... No, they died. Well, why aren't you sad? Well, I'm sad. I miss them. But I know where they are and who they're with. Again, that's why Paul could say to die and be with Christ is better by far. Now, when will the rapture happen? What date? Be very careful. Whole bunches of ministries have been ruined by people saying, I know the date. A lot of Christian lives have been marginalized by believing false teachers who say they know the date. Be very, very careful. Jesus, in his 
incarnation, the Son of God, who is God the Son, even Jesus in his physical body on earth didn't know the answer to that question. Now, obviously he knows now. But nobody knows. We're not looking for dates. We're looking for Jesus. And if we're busy about his business until he comes, won't that be wonderful when he looks at you and says, well done. When's the rapture going to happen? All I can tell you is going to happen suddenly. And I personally believe it's going to happen soon. But I've got no insight on how soon or when. I've already been wrong for a lot of years. I believed it would happen long before I got to be this old. The fifth and final thing about the rapture, and this is just fun for me, there'll be a lot of noise. For the trumpet will sound. Now don't confuse this trumpet with the trumpet judgments from the book of Revelation. This is a trumpet call, a clarion call to readiness. And this trumpet is being sounded even now, though we can't hear it. One day, we as believers are going to hear this trumpet. Now, the Revelation trumpets are trumpets that are, are, are given to angels and their judgments. This is the trumpet call of God. They cannot be one and the same. H.A. Ironside wrote this. He said, the trumpet call came from a Roman military tradition. The first trumpet meant to strike the tents and prepare to leave. The second trumpet meant to fall into line. And the third trumpet meant to march away or get up and go. And that's what this reference is. And remember, this was written in a Roman Empire. And that imagery was what Paul was using. Paul's marching orders to us are to be ready because the last trumpet is going to be the march away trumpet. Now, I think that means the doctrine of the rapture is a critical one. It's not something that we can just sort of, well, whatever happens, happens. We can't approach it casually. Here's why it's this important. Look at the next verses. For the perishable must close itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, one of the things I want all of us to realize, because we're still here and alive, this doesn't mean that the physical resurrection is going to be just sort of a new, improved version of the old you. It's a completely new order of existence. It is a completely new thing that God has done. The old you dies. Now, for you and me, spiritually speaking, we can apply this. When we come to Christ, we're new people. Now, even as I say that, if some of you are honest enough to say, Lord, well, Lord, well, why aren't I new? Why haven't I changed? Why am I still doing the same things that I always did? Why am I still running around with the same people, still using the same foul language? Why am I still getting angry? Why am I still holding on to unforgiveness? The answer is you haven't yet died spiritually. Jesus said to be his disciple, you need to pick up your cross, an instrument of execution, and you need to do that every single day. Luke adds the word daily. That's how important it is. Are you living that new life? Is there joy in your life, in your heart, where once only despair lived? Now, I know some of you go through some really difficult things. They say, well, what do I have to be joyful about? Well, we have to be joyful. We can be joyful about this promise. We can be joyful about the Holy Spirit living in us. We can be joyful about the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit that's available to all of us. If nothing else, we can be joyful that we were once going to hell and now we're not. We can be joyful because Jesus looked at you and he looked at me and he said, I love you, I'm crazy about you. That's the new existence we have to live in every day. If you are one of those Christians, I'm not questioning your salvation in saying this, if you're one of those Christians who has a hard time finding joy in anything, if you're cynical or sarcastic, or you're always waiting for that other bad shoe to drop, please repent today. That's the old you. The new you is a completely new existence. 
That's what this resurrection represents to all of us who are still alive. It means, if I step on some toes here, I'm doing so in love. It means that the condition of your life is your responsibility. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your environment. You can't blame your bosses or your neighbors or your ex-spouses. You can't blame the bad breaks that you've got in life. You've got to accept responsibility for the condition of your lives. Because when you do that, then you can say, Jesus, I can't get out of this mess that I've made. And he'll extend his hand to you. And he'll lift you up out of that mess. And for the very first time, you're going to see the sunrise, the S-O-N rise in your life. The day I gave Jesus Christ my heart, and I don't know how I know this. I just knew it then. I know it now. It was my last chance. It was the last chance that I had. And running away from home, I fell on my face. I always kind of think Jesus went boop and tripped me. And I knew I was done. I had no hope. And I looked up. Now, nothing weird happened, so please don't misunderstand this. But it was as though Jesus was there and his hand was reaching down to me. And I didn't think about nail-scarred hands. I didn't think about God's gift to the world. All I thought about was the pain my life was in and there was somebody who was willing to help me. And not only is that somebody making you these wonderful promises today, but that somebody right now, if you need him, is extending that hand to you. No guilt. This is a no guilt zone this morning. He's saying, how about you and I, we do this together. And how about we get started right now? That's why Paul says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? He says, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Think about those words for a moment. Death is something that we're all afraid of. It's instinctively built into all of us. Now, that's sort of a point of tension with Christians. We shouldn't be afraid of death. We should welcome it. But we don't. Now, I'm as sure as anybody in this room that I'm going to be with Jesus the minute I die. And I like to think, and maybe this is true, maybe I'm not being honest with myself, but I like to think that I'm not so much afraid of death as I am the process of dying. No one looks forward to that, and I, I, I want us to be real here. I'm not being naive. I'm not saying, praise the Lord, we're going to die. I'm not saying that at all. But here's what I'm saying. When we face death, when these bodies begin to give out, and if yours hasn't begun to give out yet, just look at me. <laughs> As these bodies start to give out, you worry about those things. And we're fearful about those things. When I was faced with my first heart surgery and 2017, and then had to repeat it. It was a more delicate surgery in 2018 because the pacemaker they put in wasn't functioning. All I could do was look at Paul and say, don't let me embarrass Jesus. Don't let me embarrass you. Don't let this thing that I'm afraid of cause me to bring shame or embarrassment to my Lord. When we get bad news, when we start to experience things, death has already been defeated. The second surgery was, I've got to be careful with the time here. The second surgery was difficult for me. I'd never, I've never before until that time been under an anesthetic. And I'm super sensitive to things. And I tried to get them to do it 
without putting me under. The first surgery, I convinced them. The second time, I didn't. They, they just said they couldn't do it. And as I was laying in that super, super cold room, looking at those lights and looking at people treating me like a piece of meat, I saw that mask come over my mouth and nose. And all I could think about was, Jesus, this is what it's going to be like. I'm going to go to sleep and I'm going to wake up and there you'll be. We needn't fear death. But when we are dying, Calvary Chapel, when we are dying, Jesus will be right there with you, holding your hand. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. If I would have had those health issues before I was saved, I can promise you I would have been in a completely different frame of mind. But thanks be to God. As born-again Christians, we know to whom we belong. We know where we're going because he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Final application of all of this talk about resurrection is verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, and I'm going to add, therefore, my dear sisters in Christ, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now people say, well, why should I give everything to the Lord? Well, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. You see, what standing firm is, it's serving the people of God. It's serving the people who aren't yet his. I hope every one of you is looking for that moment when you get to heaven and you'll be able to see the people who look at you with such gratitude because you were the instrument God used to win them to Christ. There is the one who told me, someone will say. There is the one who is bugging me every day. I used to tell them, stop praying for me. But they didn't. And you'll be there and you won't have to say a word just with a smile on your face. You will know. Jesus will know. Stand firm. This world is trying to destroy our walk, our witness. We can't let the world win. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, one foot in the word. We'll never belong anywhere. We'll be unbalanced. We've got to be men and women who are completely, irrevocably committed to Jesus Christ no matter what. We've got to decide today that this is how we stand firm. You can push, but I'm immovable, we need to be able to say. And the only way to do that is to be active in sharing our faith. The only way to do that is to make sure as you look at your life in these last few minutes that we have together this morning, look at your life. Let the Holy Spirit shine a light on the darkness in your heart and and decide that, you know what, I'm going to stop sinning. I don't want to do this anymore. Your flesh wants to sin, but the real you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, All you want to do is be pleasing to the Lord. That's the only way we can stand firm. It means that we have to agree with Jesus and his word. We can't be persuaded by the world to soften our positions. It means that we've got to be men and women who are immovable. Why? Because we believe. Because we believe everything that God has told us. We believe unapologetically every single promise in the word of God is ours. You see, really living is really living for Jesus. Otherwise, you're not really living at all. 
So let me close by combining these two sentences. Verse 57, but thanks be to God. And verse 58, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Paul was writing to a church in Corinth that had been moving. People would come in and tell him new things and so they would be moved and the same thing sadly is true in our church culture. In the last 20 months or so, we've all been to the breaking point, haven't we? At one time or another, we've just thought, how much longer we can't take this any longer? And it's not just COVID. It's all the other things associated with, with quarantine. It's all the things associated with the fear of things that we've never faced before. Paul would say, the Spirit of God is saying to you through me, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And the only way we can do that is to be grateful. But thanks be to God, because you've taken the things I am the most afraid of, and you've given me peace. If you're here this morning, you're not a believer. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. If you're here as a believer, and you've been a little shaky, you've been moved a little bit by the world that we live in, maybe there's some things that Jesus says that, well, I'm not sure I agree with that, you think. I'm giving you a chance today to once again put your feet on solid ground where you'll never again be moved. Father, As we, I thank you, Lord, for the more than a year it took us to get to this place. 